Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 24 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. Webistic CEO. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm joined here by my trusty co-host, former market day and present day trading guru, a man who's attempting to lead all trading donkeys in the right direction, and a man who's just attempting to lead his own life in the right direction. <laughs> I'm talking about the Kumar lookalike from Harold and Kumar. Jeez. I'm talking about JJ. JJ, how's it going? Good. Jeez, wow, you really put a lot behind that one too. Wow. <sighs> you know, it, it's tough. You know, I started the um, the trend of the intros, so it's tough. You know, I just got to keep it going every episode. Today, our guest, <laughs> the former U.S. interest rates market maker for 10 years quantitative researcher and systematic trader a man who teaches finance professionals how to harness the power of python to build sophisticated trading models the author of the alpha formula talking about christopher kane chris how's it going what's up guys thanks for having me on i like that sopranos reference you had there <laughs> oh he got <laughs> oh, he it he got it, oh, he got it. <laughs> you know webistics i remember that <laughs> oh man that's great chris i'm so glad you caught that man i you know i figured like a you know a, a new york jersey guy yeah we would get the reference oh, oh good. yeah good Absolutely. that makes me feel good that makes me feel much better oh yeah. excellent chris pleasure having you on man uh you know someone who is proficient uh, in building models uh, it's someone we've been looking for uh to talk to and i know the listeners as well you know, a lot of people talk about algorithms and trading. So, you know, it'd be good to get your take and what's true and what's not, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, and par- pardon our ignorance, you know, cause, cause you're, you're above our pay grade. So th- this stuff is stuff we're not too familiar with. And so, but first off, uh, give the listeners a little background on yourself um, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Absolutely. So I'll try to keep this uh, brief. So um, right out of college, I got a uh, job at a um, small boutique um, bond dealer so called GX Clark as a, uh, like you said, interest rate market maker. Um, so I, I was basically there for the good part of 11 years. Um, so I won't bore you with all the stuff that I traded at that time. Um, suffice to say, I started you know, trading the sh- what's called the short end of the curve. So U.S. Treasury bills. Um, and other short-term debt. Um, you know, if you know about bonds, you know they start you there because you can't really get in too much trouble because you know those things just don't really move too much. So it's kind of like trading with training wheels in a way. So um, you know, I moved out the curve and took more risk. You know, as I became more senior, I started trading different types of debt. So not just treasury bonds, but uh, U.S. agency bonds and other types of bonds as well. Um, that firm ended up getting bought by a larger firm called INTLFC Stone. Um, yeah, I forget what year that was. I think 2014 or so. So what was the, you know, GX Clark was basically a 60 person shop. We just made markets in US um, government guaranteed debt. So what was GX Clark basically became the fixed income um, arm of FC Stone. So I worked there for several years, uh, left around a year ago, and I started working with my mentor, Larry Connors. Um, You know, so we do, so right now I'm I'm a senior quantitative researcher for Connors Research. So we do, um, you know, quantitative research, present systematic trading um, to, you know, we have private research groups with select hedge funds, um, family offices, high net worth individuals, that type of thing. Um, Also, you know, we wrote a book um, called The Alpha Formula, which is available on tradingmarkets.com right now, but it's going to be available on Amazon uh, next month. Uh, so we can speak about that. Also, we started a business for um, Python programming for traders. Uh, we can get more into that as well. Um, so that is my two-second background. Um, just the only thing I would add to that is, you know, I, I was a market maker, like I said, for 10 years, but I was always very, very interested in, you know, how to trade my own money. Um, so I always, you know, gravitated towards the systematic way. It's just kind of what resonated with me. So, you know, it was, it was many, many years of fits and starts there. You know, there was a many, there was a long time where, you know, I wasn't a market maker for my day job or a trader for my day job, but you know, I didn't really know what to do with my own money. So I kind of like, I'm a pretty risk averse person. So I sat in cash. Um, but you know, over the years I developed several strategies. So I do that very seriously as well. So right now I run, um, you know, multiple strategies, um, in my own personal account. Um, so, you know, that's been going for, for a couple of years as well. So I take that, uh, take that pretty seriously as well. 
Mm-hmm. Awesome. Now you, you didn't, uh, what, what year did you start? Um, as a market maker was it wasn't the greatest time was it no yes uh, my first day was june 15th 2008 yeah yeah so how i mean so just starting at that time i mean what was it like for you you know just starting your career uh you know just on a personal level oh crazy man so you know it's funny like looking back on it i don't think i had the perspective that I would have had now, you know, because I was, mm-hmm. you know, 23 years old and didn't know anything. Um, so, you know, I obviously knew that crazy stuff was happening that fall and the financial crisis. And I realized this was a once, a, you know, once in a lifetime, really, um, you know, event. But, you know, even looking back on it now was way crazier um, with the benefit of hindsight and, and the perspective I have now. Um, but yeah, I mean, especially, you know, we traded even at that time, thankfully I was just a trader's assistant at that time. Cause I was three months into the job, mm-hmm. but you know, we traded short-term interest rates. So, you know, without getting too deep, um, we traded, you know, interest rate swaps, um, Euro dollar futures. Um, like I said, short-term treasury bills, um, you know, the Euro dollar futures are based on LIBOR. So, you know, all those rates just became completely disconnected. Um, and you know, it was just the money markets, um, which is what, you know, the desk that I worked on at the time was, you know, as boring as money markets is like, that was like Armageddon for the money market market. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was rather, uh, you know, it's definitely a, a crazy time to start, but I, I was fortunate in the sense that I graduated, you know, college in obviously earlier in 2008, cause like one year later, I mean, there was just no jobs at all. So mm. that was, that was pretty fortunate, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And, and to be able to, sorry to interject, but to be able to hang on to your job in that period, um, you know, that says a lot too. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we were, we were pretty a fortunate firm because, you know, like I said, um, you know, GS Clark was a really old school firm. It was a old school Wall Street partnership and oh, nice. we uh, only traded U.S. government guaranteed debt. So treasury bonds, agency bonds, and agency backed mortgage bonds. So, you know, we were like the only firm where the financial crisis was actually really good for us. I mean, obviously there was some hairy times there, but, you know, everyone rushed into, you know, the safety of that government guaranteed debt. So, you know, one of my, one of the old partners used to say, you know, if you're familiar with New York, you used to say, it's like the path is down and we were running the ferry. You know, mm-hmm. because like, yeah, really, exactly. We're really, really the only way to kind of the only way to go. So it was actually a uh, pretty good years there. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I enjoyed the, um, the story you told on uh, the alpha mind podcast and we, we don't have to get into it, but, uh, and I believe you wrote about it in your book about, um, the, when you came to your boss with the negative interest rate. So yeah. I, I thought that was a, you told it well and it's a funny story. So we don't have to get into it. So if you guys go listen to Stephen Goldstein's podcast and read his book as well. Um, so Chris, so, so how do you go from market maker now to the Connors research? Yeah. So like I said, uh, kind of in my intro, I was always very interested in quantitative trading, systematic trading. So I always did mm-hmm. that um, as well as being a market maker, um, you know, and, and we did do, you know, some systems and modeling and, and quantitative trading in, in the market making role mm-hmm. as well. Okay. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the way I wanted to move. Um, you know, I was a market maker and fixed income for a long time. I uh, kind of thought that I'd took it as far as I can go. Um, uh-huh. So, you know, this is really where my passion is, um, you know, building models, systematic trading, um, you know, that type of thing. So, you know, and I've known Larry, uh, Larry Connors, not, not personally, but I, you know, I've known of him for a long time because he's wrote, written many books and such. Um, so, you know, when I left my job, I reached out to him. Uh, we kind of hit it off right away because we're, we're very similar. Um, thought we could do some good things together. You know, I was bringing to him kind of a, a different skill set than what he had specifically with the Python, um, which is very powerful. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, so that's that's kind of how I got to got to where I am right now. Nice, nice. So so modeling it that that's I know you mentioned you did it a little bit as a market maker. When did in your so when did you first start trading your own money? And have you always um, I know you say you're a systematic trader. So have you always been model approach? Really great question. So, you know, I mean, technically I started doing trades in like college and stuff, but you know, I was just punting around, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just, just, you know, whatever, re- reading some news stories and doing whatever. So, you know, that wasn't really serious. Um, once I got into, you know, New York and, and market making, you know, that really took up all my time initially because the, 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 uh, you know, learning curve is very steep, but, um, you know, like I said, I, I always read a lot of books about the market, you know, wanted to be a systematic trader. So, 
like I said, many years where, you know, I couldn't find one, you know, I couldn't find a strategy that I thought was viable that I had confidence in. Uh, so I didn't really do anything for, for a couple of years. My first real strategy that I put together was a kind of a classic trend following type strategy, really a breakout strategy um, that I developed using uh, or trading the Forex market. So I started trading that in 2013. Um, I ceased uh, production of that in 2015. It was actually a very successful run, but I think that was just more lucky than anything because 2014 was just like the dollar rallied against basically everything. Um, so that I benefited from that, but I obviously found some flaws in that strategy. Um, so from there, I just kept adding more strategies. So I still do trend following. Um, I, we also do, you know, what I call like factor modeling for lack of a better term. So meaning, um, you know, using, you know, factors, whether it be fundamental factors or technical factors um, to, to trade individual stocks. Um, so we do, we do that type of stuff. I also do, you know, long, short, mean reversion strategies, again, trading individual stocks, um, some vol trading and some, uh, some fixed income as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so basically the answer to your question is, you know, I, I kept adding strategies as I went along and, you know, that was really a, a turning point for me as far as performance and everything is I really realized that, you know, instead of trying to get the perfect model, you yeah. know, adding models that are uncorrelated is a big deal. You know, it really decreases your risk and it really makes your equity curve much smoother. So that's basically where my focus has been over the last couple of years. Right, right, right. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would imagine, you know, I'm not, not proficient at all, but I would imagine like anything, it's an ever evolving process. Um, excellent. And, and, uh, your time as a market maker, I would assume, you know, seeing order flow, just knowing how the ins and outs of the market, uh, helped you give you maybe an edge, I would say. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, as a market maker, you guys know, you know, you sit there and, and stare at prices for 12 hours a day. So you certainly mm -hmm. pick up tendencies that I, I don't think other people would see, um, if they don't have that job. You know, as a market maker, you do, you know, you can make money from some of the flow. Um, obviously, as a systematic trader, you don't really incorporate that, or I guess some people could, but I don't. Um, but, you know, like I said, you, you do see some of the tendencies of the market. And not only that, you see um, behavior of investors. And, you know, I'm, I'm really big on that, mm -hmm. you know, basically rooting your strategies in, you know, other investors' behavioral biases, because I don't believe those are really going to change. And I think, you know, those are strategies that should basically stand the test of time, right. and continue to work. Doesn't mean they're going to work every month or year, but, you mm -hmm. know, as opposed to a structural inefficiency, which could get, you know, get closed once the market becomes more efficient over time. So, you know, you really see that as a market maker, you know, one of the, one of the other things you see is that, you know, institutions are no different than a regular person. Whereas they have behavioral biases as well. They panic, mm -hmm. you know, they're greedy. They have confirmation bias and, and, you know, um, the disposition effect and recency bias and all this kind of stuff, just like a regular person would have. So, you know, yeah. I've seen many institutions, you know, do quote unquote, illogical things. Um, so that's one of the things that's really drilled into your head as a market maker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was funny. We, our, our guest, uh, guest last week was a former market maker as well. Danny Hughes, and uh, she was talking about how she was a big uh, history buff. And uh, that's what we we're talking about, like human behavior, human psychology doesn't change. So it's interesting. Yeah, it doesn't change, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that's behind a lot of, you know, um, the, the market, quote unquote, anomalies that you see. Some people call them factors, anomalies, whatever. Um, but, you know, I you know, you want to root, root your trading strategies in those anomalies. And hopefully the anomaly is based on, you know, human misbehavior, because like I said, I mean, I think people will just continue to do that. And I don't see people, I don't see any evidence of people getting more logical. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, like yeah. JJ, JJ says when people are buying a, how much people are spending money on a pet clothing nowadays, he calls it the pet clothing indicator. That's how they know there's too much money in the market. Yeah. There was like, you know, f almost $500 million spent on Halloween costumes for pets. So, I, you know, it's, you know, things like that. <laughs> That's a whole nother subject, but uh, it's a little cruel to animals in my opinion. But anyway, JJ, before we move on, anything uh, for Chris on his background, uh, you know, as a market maker, anything of that nature? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's nice having uh, someone here, uh, you know, from, from the fixed income side. It's really great to, uh, you know, to, to get your experience. We had a gentleman on who did a lot of the, 
the uh, you know CDO pricing and, and building of those assets and, and having a market maker here is is pretty is pretty cool. And I think uh, what what's interesting from what I know about you is that um, I mean you're not you're not a pure math guy like you don't have a PhD in math or a PhD in physics. So, so you actually know the mechanics of trading and sort of, you know, the, the mechanics of order flow and that sort of thing. And I, and, and do you find that that really helps you? I mean, like, you know, when you're running a model and you're seeing something that's not right, you'll step in and not just blindly trust the model because you have, you know, that real world, world experience of observing mm -hmm. price action. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know. I mean, that's, I, I think that's really, you know, my advantage, if you will. I mean, you know, like you said, I am not a pure math guy. I don't have a PhD. I just read, um, you know, the Ren Tech book. Uh, yeah, and, I, and, I, out. and I know you had, <laughs> yeah. And you had uh, Zuckerman on the podcast, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah. And, you know, those guys are amazing, but you know, one of the, one of my takeaways from reading that book is I'm not trying to em emulate them. Right. I mean, so yeah. mm -hmm. a lot of the, the, the trading strategies and models and I, and, you know, I use those, those words interchangeably. Um, you know, they, they do come with intuition, right? I mean, not like I'm going to override the signals, but I, at least the design of the models is like, you know, I think this tendency is a real thing. I think it happens because investors do A, B and C, what's a good way to measure that? What's a robust way to, you know, take advantage of that. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of how I, um, you know, apply this and, and how I go about it. And I think the, where people get, you know, into trouble is super smart people might do it the other way, you know, whereas it's like, right. I don't really care what it is. I'm just going to, you know, feed this machine learning algorithm or whatever, a bunch of features and it's going to pop out, you know, the, the answer, but you know, I know Renaissance Technologies did that and, you know, but I, I'm, you know, I'm a little skeptical of that approach because I, I think rooting, you know, rooting the, the thought process of the strategies in, you know, your own, your own market observations um, is a big deal. So that's why, that's what I try to do. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was gonna say it makes, um, at least to me, that makes a ton of sense. You know, I always trying to equate things to poker to at least help my understanding of trading and it's like poker though the evolution of poker is you know there's these things called sol solvers um and pretty much it's you know poker is just a complicated math question and it'll spit out answers and you should do this 20 percent of the time you should raise other 20 percent of the time but then there's so but i don't play, play strictly by that chris you know what i'm saying it's like it, sometimes i know that my my opponent might just not have it here you know, I, I just sure. have that, that intuition. And so I, I think it's a perfect, like you were saying, you kind of, it's like a perfect blend. You, you rely on technology, but also that, uh, whatever you're, you want to call it, for lack of a better term, intuition. So I, uh, yeah, sure. Makes yeah. A lot of sense. I was just, I was just going to say when, um, like I was, you know, uh, LTCM was before your time with John Merriweather and those guys, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they had, but I think, from my sort of naive observation is is when the math guys try and bully a market and they don't realize that you know they're the only ones you know buying <laughs> holding it up um you know and then they get so much size on that they can't move the position um i, I think that's where you get into trouble you know um, absolutely i mean yes ltcm was before my time but i've i've read a lot about that i read the i forget what the book it was um but i think when genius failed. That that's it. Really that's cool. it. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it's interesting. And even in the, the Renaissance book, you know, one of the things, I mean, there's so many amazing things in that book, but one of the things was that, you know, Simon's, you know, as, as brilliant as he is, you know, when things start breaking down and, you know, granted their track record so great, it didn't break down very many times, but mm -hmm. when things do start breaking down, you know, you want to survive, right? So mm -hmm. you want to de-risk, survive, yeah. play the next day where, you know, LTCM didn't do that. I mean, literally they, they gave all the investor money back, tripled down yeah. and, and just thought that their, their, their models were reality. And yeah, yeah that, that's obviously was the wrong decision. <laughs> Definitely. Right. right. For sure. So, yeah. So, so more of the stories, let's not blindly, just blindly follow it. Yes. <laughs> A little totally. bit of mix. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. All right. And so um, now uh, we're going to take a brief intermission are you still looking for a last minute holiday gift? Well, Confessions of a Market Maker is pleased to announce that we have an official sponsor for the pod, Trader's Creed. 
celebrating traders and investors success, providing apparel and merchandise with humor and wit along the way. Choose from a variety of apparel designs and products for the trader in your life. Visit traderscreed.com. JJ, I know you're a big fan of their RSI shirt with the guy power cleaning. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. And uh, you know, the, the uh, cruising, the cruising VWAP t-shirt is, uh, you know, I'm all about that. That's, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's it, cool. It, it's yeah, cool. I, really, I, I like, I like their stuff. And, and also, you know, it actually comes in sizes for regular size guys. They have three X, four X, you know, for, yeah. uh, you know, for those of us who are a little bit on the bigger side. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Clothing to fit the gorilla. Yes. Excellent. And, uh, you know, we're also in talks of me modeling some of the tank tops. So be on the lookout for that. <laughs> Traderscreed.com. All right. Anyway. All right. Jumping back in over here. So, uh, so Chris, so, so much talk among retail traders, uh, about algorithms, algos, maybe some know what they're talking about. Others probably don't we like to clear some things up. So we've got a barrage of questions from listeners and people in our trading room. So uh, I got a lot. So I'm going to try and uh, do this in a timely manner, Chris, and uh, pardon some of the, uh, the ignorance, like I was saying before, if some of these questions are dumb. All right, but all right, let's see here. Uh, so Python has become the hottest programming language on Wall Street and is now being used by the biggest quantitative trading firms in the world. Why is this, Chris? Oh man, that, that was a softball. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> hey, come on, man. man. Yeah, yeah, right. Come on, bite you on, man. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I got to do you good, man. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I love Python, so don't get me started. But uh, yeah, I mean, Python is really nice language because you know the what's called syntax. So like literally the the code that you write yeah, right. is relatively straightforward. Um, it's very readable, especially once you get the hang of it. So like by the human eye. Um, so that's one, you know, and I think why it's really taken over quantitative finance is there's so many packages that are specifically designed for data manipulation. Um, you know, mm -hmm. people call data wrangling, data manipulation. Um, you know, so it was like MATLAB and R was really the, um, you know, languages that were good at that. But, um, you know, Python over the last couple of years have had, you know, a lot of advances in some of the packages that are available in the language that really, you know, surpass that. And um, I think that's why it's kind of become the preeminent language. So specifically, I'm talking about things like NumPy, Pandas, um, you know, so, you know, if you can get good at that stuff, you could manipulate any data set you want in a very, very fast manner, um, you know, way faster than Excel or anything like that. And not only that, with a, you know, proper programming language, the, you know, the transforms, if you will, can be, you know, repeatedly done. So think about like in Excel, you know, you have to, you know, maybe copy this here and paste it there. And this cell depends on that cell. And if one thing breaks and the, you know, there could be a chain event where everything breaks and in, you know, and something like Python, you know, that doesn't really happen. You know, you have a script, you know, and whatever you feed it in. So let's say the data the next day and it's updated, right. It's going to do the same transforms and, you know, um, manipulate that data in the same way. Um, so that's really one of the reasons. Another reason is because, you know, simply there's a lot of backtesting um, programs that are built in the language, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, there's a firm called Quant Connect. The one that I really use is called Quantopian and their um, open source uh, backtester is called Zipline. You know, it's just a really nice way to backtest strategies. You could backtest um, portfolio strategies. So not just like one thing at a time, you know, a bunch of stocks or whatever at a time. Um, so, you know, it's one of those um, self-propelling things, um, you know, whereas if more people start using it, more tools are made for the language, which begets more people using it, which begets more tools for the language. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of a, a, a snowball that's going down the hill here that I don't think it's going to stop. So mm -hmm. I would say those are, you know, those are the two main reasons why, um, and if I could just give one more, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think a lot of the reason why, you know, the finance industry from hedge funds to investment banks, et cetera, really like Python is, you know, some people call Python like the Swiss army knife of coding languages. And what, mm -hmm. and what people mean by that is that, you know, you can do everything from your analysis, back testing, data manipulation, sending trades, you know, um, making 
code that like shows you your risk all with one, you know, um, coding language, which is Python. Um, whereas in the past, you know, a lot of people would, let's say, do the modeling with like MATLAB and then maybe do the production code with like C sharp. And, you know, there was different code, um, coding languages for different types of tasks, whereas Python could kind of do it all. Um, so I think those are some of the reasons why it's really become very preeminent in the industry. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I, I, I can tell your vigor for it, your, uh, the enthusiasm in your voice. Uh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so Chris, all right. So next question in the old days, wall street trading firms would recruit uh, the brightest business minds from Ivy league colleges. Uh, is it safe to say today that they were recruiting the brightest coders or financial engineers as they're called? It depends on, I mean, I would say mostly yes. I mean, you see, you say recruiting, so that would be like from school. So yeah, yes, mm -hmm. from school, I think that's probably true. Um, now, you know, w one of my things is that, you know, systematic trading and that type of thing, you know, that's not really a pure coding contest, right? It's not like the best coder is going to be the best systems trader, mm -hmm. right? Um, if that was true, then, you know, all the PhDs would just be the best right. traders, but that's not exactly true, right? So, you know, I, I think there's a huge need for people with real world experience, um, you know, with real views about the market, um, with, you know, theories, and then you could put those theories to code. Um, but coming out of school, yes. I mean, I would encourage everyone to learn how to code. Um, you know, I think it's a very, very, very valuable skill. And it's certainly one of the things that you're going to need to get your foot in the door these days. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, cool. For sure. Okay, next question. Is it important for these coders or financial engineers to understand trading or just coding? Can you explain how a trading firm will develop an algorithm to use from concept to implementation. So I know that's kind of might be a lot, but sure, totally. So I, I would say that is very important, um, but it kind of depends on the firm. I mean, if you have a huge firm and you have traders that, that, you know, articulate the ideas and they give them to the coders and the coders just do what the traders or PMs tell them to do, then, you know, maybe not, but most places aren't like that. Right. Um, most places, you know, you're going to want to, you know, develop the strategy, develop the theory and express it in code and, you know, analyze your results and make sure it's robust and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, in that sense, you do have to have, in my opinion, you know, some trading chops, if you will. I mean, at least some theories about the market, some observations mm -hmm. that you want to test, you know, not just throw things against the wall and see what sticks. So I do think that's very important. Um, but, you know, the answer to this question really depends on the firm. I mean, you know, if you have a small hedge fund, you know, people are going to wear a lot of hats. If you have, you know, Millennium or whatever, you know, there's going to be teams of coders <laughs> that are going to, you know, they're just going to take your idea and put it into production and, and all that kind of stuff. So it really does depend on the size of the firm as far as how separate they are or how, how much they're integrated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the, like the second part of that question was, uh, can you um, how ex explain how a trading firm will develop an algorithm to use? So from conception to implementation. Sure. Again, th this is going to depend on the size of the firm, mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, the general flow chart would be, you know, usually the, let's call it the market person. So either the trader or the PM will have an idea, mm -hmm. right? And they'll say, you know, I'm trying to take advantage of this mean reversion tendency over this time frame and this universe, you know, um, coded up. Maybe they have help of, of a team for the coders. Mm -hmm. You know, that goes through months of testing, right? So you really want to make sure that, you know, um, the system holds up to many different parameter changes, mm -hmm. Um, you know, that basically you're generalizing well, right? You, you are, you're overall capturing the tendencies that you want um, and not being too specific. And I can go into that a little more. Mm -hmm. Once, once the, those hurdles are passed, um, you know, usually if it goes into production, meaning like it's just going to spit out trades, um, you know, again, this is going to be depend on the size of the firm, but sometimes they will you know, they'll take the, the code that you use to back test and they're not going to change any of the logic, but they'll, you know, clean it up and make it like production ready. Um, and from there, it's just a matter of, you know, observing it, making sure it's doing correctly, um, making sure that the performance is in line with what you expect. 
um, making sure that nothing you don't think has changed in the marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that is the, uh, the general uh, life, you know, the flow chart, if you will. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. What is the desired accuracy and what is the desired profit margin for winners versus losers? Oh, that's a tough one. So, you know, that's a nuanced answer, man, because that really depends. Um, right. It really, really depends. I mean, let's just take a few ones, right? So if you have a mean reversion strategy and let's say that it's, you know, the average holding period is two days, right? You know, usually a strategy like that will have a high win percentage, but maybe the average win and the average loss might be relatively equal, right? So let's say, you know, it's right 70% of the time and you have a one-to-one average win to average loss. That in my experience, you know, is, is something that you can expect from that type of strategy, um, you know, like a, a convergent type strategy or mean reversion. Um, whereas, you know, the opposite of that would be something like trend following, which is divergent, which is, um, you know, the, the, the characteristics of a strategy like that would be, you know, maybe you're only right 40% of the time or 35% of the time, but maybe your win is, th- you know, your average win is three times bigger than your average loss, you know? So it really depends on mm-hmm. what you're trying to do. And this goes to the point of, you know, having that understanding and having those expectations going in is very important. You know, if I have a mean reversion strategy and it's only right 40% of the time, that's red flags right there. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, having those expectations, having that, that frame of mind before you even start the test, you know, and that's where the experience comes in to me is very important. Sure. So sure. You, you can't just say one blanket answer to that. Right. Right. And, and, and I'm sure what I'm about to ask might be nuanced too as well, but is there a certain, like when you're back testing these models, is there a certain desired, um, uh, percent that you're looking for like profitability like like you said 40 percent that would be a red flag is there something like are you looking for 51 52 or it, it depends on the strategy i would say it depends on the strategy you mm-hmm. know it depends on the strategy um but I, I would also say certainly i call them like trading statistics um are important so that's like kind of what we're talking about here meaning like percent wins average win to average loss, mm-hmm. people say like profit factor. Okay. Those are important. I'm not saying they're not. Um, and you should, you should check those out, you know, but also you want to see on a portfolio basis, how this hap- how this works. So that's kind of where I focus more. I want to see, you know, what are the returns? What's the vol? What's the sharp? What is, um, you know, the max drawdown. And after those hurdles are passed also, what is the rolling correlation of that strategy that I'm thinking about trading to my other strategies that I have? And, you know, that's really where the magic happens. If you could add something, even if it's not mind blowingly, you know, even if it's not great on a standalone basis, but it has a, you know, 0.1 correlation to the rest of your portfolio that could just add a ton of value Mm. to the portfolio as a whole. Right. So, you know, I, I, I kind of focus on that stuff more than, you know, is this a 55% win rate or a 58% win rate? Yeah, um, right. That makes know. sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Next question. Uh, do they turn the algos off ahead of events? Uh, we hear people use phrases like the algos are off. So I, I think uh, the best answer to that, I mean, let's just make a distinction, right? So mm-hmm. There's a big distinction between, you know, a systematic trading, let's say model, like some of the things that I do, right? So that could, that could range from, like I said, a mean reversion model, a factor model, a longer term trend following model, you know, those are ways you can think about them as ways to invest, right? Yep. And a trading, you know, what's, what's sometimes called an algo, a lot of that stuff is high frequency trading, you know, providing liquidity, uh, mark, mark execution, market making type algos. You know, I actually developed something like that uh, for trading U.S. Treasury bonds when I was a market maker. Okay. So, so you know, that's really different. Like those, those mo- you know, those things. Um, you know, we'll do things like look at like how much is on the bid, how much is on the ask. Mm-hmm. You know, like where's a good r- way. You know, where's a good um, point to put my bid in to provide liquidity here to get out really quick, you know, that type mm-hmm. of thing. And, you know, that also extends to things like VWAP algos and, you know, 
even as, is you could even think of it as as simple as like a trailing stop in a way is kind yep. of like an algo like that yep. right so you know i think when a lot of people um I hear people like complain about algos sometimes, if you will. <laughs> uh, Jesus, yeah, no I, kidding. I, yeah, yeah. I, I think they're mostly talking about those type of ones um, as opposed yeah. to systematic models like that. Right. Um, you know, and I think that has certainly changed the dynamic of the marketplace, especially if you have a shorter term time frame. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, th th that's a big distinction there. I, I noticed the price action uh, will stop on a dime. Uh, we trade the E-mini. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's amazing how, uh, you know, on sort of a bracketed or, or a balanced day, price will actually stop and reverse, like to the tick where you think it will. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of freaky. When you take a lot of the sort of human execution out, you get, you don't have that, you know, you know, those 20 guys buying at the end and there's that little excess, you know, yep. uh, you know, the machine doesn't, doesn't, you know, get you know finicky so it just stops right there i find that very that herky jerky price action took me a long time to adjust through to coming from equities um you know where we used to trade over the phone <laughs> absolutely you know? absolutely and uh you know it, it has changed a lot of things i mean i i'll be transparent with you guys i'm not and this is not you know any kind of judgment but you know i, I just don't do day trading very much so or really at all so yeah. um you know, but I hear everyone talk about this, so I'm 100% oh, yeah. sure it's, it's correct. <laughs> um, but e even like as a market maker, like, you know, you know, it's when you're all over the phone, you know, it's, it's way different, right? Totally. It's way totally. Slower, way yeah. different. Oh, yeah. And then, but the other side of that is when you have a super liquid thing, like let's say U.S. Treasury bonds or E-mini futures, I mean, those, you know, the, the machines are obviously going to be way more efficient um, than the humans at, at doing that. And, and certainly the algos have a big impact there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, <laughs> next question we have up, um, guy wanted to know if you uh, name your, algos or, or, or i guess your models <laughs> what, like, like jarvis is, it, yeah, is that like a common practice yeah uh, i don't know not really yeah <laughs> I, I don't have uh no i don't have nicknames for my algos not really. okay <laughs> it's okay, not that personal <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly all right um um are like are you concerned i don't know how to phrase this question uh, the question is are you concerned with hiding size so I don't know how, if that applies to modeling, if that's a factor or whatnot. Um, again, I, I think that's more of a factor if you're a little bit more short term than, than I am. Exactly. Right. Um, but I certainly think, it, you know, if you are, you know, intraday in and out, in and out, in and out, I mean, that, that's definitely something that you need to think about. Right. I mean, and there's a lot of games that get played and spoofing and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So certainly if you're, if you're operating on that time frame, which again, I just, I can't really speak too much to it because I don't, um, but I certainly think that's something that you have to worry about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are, are you scared that the algo will develop an intense hatred for humans? <laughs> it's like a term, it's like a Terminator situation. Like Skynet? Yeah. Uh, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. That's, that's, that's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be yeah. out of business yeah. soon. Shout, shout out to uh, LC. That was from him. Oh, that's from LC. <laughs> that's from LC. Yeah. LC yeah. Go, go get some sleep, brother. Yeah. yeah you, don't, you don't sleep. All right. These are uh, insomniac. Okay. All right. Next one. Okay. As a retail trader, how should we use um, what you do as modeling or what the algos do in trading to, I guess, help us or, or maybe is there anything that we need to understand that will help us maybe stay out of the way or stay out of uh, traffic as Jay likes to say? Sure. Um, so I, I, again, this is going to be a little bit of a nuanced answer. I mean, if you're an intraday trader, right, it's kind of a different game, right? So let me just talk about maybe, you know, what I do, which is more of a, a longer term, mm -hmm. um, you know, systems trader. I mean, to me, I think, you know, people can benefit big time from systems trading, even if you don't want to be completely systematic, you know, it does force discipline, mm -hmm. right? Um, it does force a repeatable, process that you do every time x happens you do y now this is you know granted um you know you follow your strategy which is a big if um but let's assume that you do you know that that discipline that's showing up every day um you know doing the same things every day and letting those probabilities 
play out in your favor is a big deal, you know? So I think one of the big things, um, you know, I always think of it as with a systematic trading, it's almost like I'm taking, or I'm looking to take advantage of other people's behavioral biases and as well as avoid them myself. Right. And you're not going to avoid all of them. And I'm, I'm a human being too, but you know, if we get if we can identify things about the market, um, you know, market tendencies that we think are driven by, you know, quote unquote, irrational behavior by others, and then have a systematic uh, way, you know, process in place where, you know, here are my rules, the computer's going to tell me what to do, and I'm just going to do it every time, you know, that's a double whammy positive for you, right? Because you're taking advantage of other human uh, behavioral biases and hopefully, um, you know, avoiding them yourself. So I think, you know, it's the discipline um, that systematic trading kind of, you know, has um, ingrained in it that I think a lot of people can benefit from. And I'll just say one more thing, like you don't have to be, you know, I'm, I'm completely systematic. Uh, whereas, you know, anything that I do as far as changing is going to go through months of testing. And, you know, I'm, I'm you know, mm-hmm. I know what I'm doing every day, you know, I, not literally like what trades, but I know if X happens, I'm going to do Y. It's not like if X happens, let me see what I'm going to do. Right. But you don't have to be like that. Right. You, you, you could be discretionary. You could be a bit of a hybrid, but even having generalized rules. Right. And you say, mm-hmm. okay, you know, every time this happened, you know, there seems to be an edge here. I was able to back test it. So it's something that I could look out for. And I still might use my discretion to an extent, but you know, it, it creates some structure. I think that could be very beneficial for, for almost everyone. Right. Right. How, how much of your, I would imagine you spend a lot more time modeling and back testing than actually trading. Correct. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my, my, my day, as far as trading, it couldn't be more boring. I mean, really, I mean, literally I either transact at the beginning of the day or end of the day. Now meet by transact. I mean, you know, either do the transaction or, you know, potentially put in a limit order depends on the the strategy, but yeah, it's not a lot of screen time. It's not like, you know, I'm just a nerd. So I like to like watch cause I think it's entertaining, but <laughs> I, I don't, you know, it's, it's not very, um, a lot of work in that sense. So yeah, almost all the time is, is spent, you know, coding, modeling and, and, uh, testing new, new ideas. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. No, this is good stuff, Chris. I'm, I'm really enjoying this so far. Okay. So next one we have up here. So um, another thing a lot of retail traders talk about is uh, the algos responding to Trump's tweets. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. If, if it's even relevant. I think it's certainly relevant. Again, this is not my area of expertise, but I mean, I, I, I have done some Python coding where it's like, you know, so basically you could, you could scrape text. You know, um, right. you, you know, you can see this from uh, even like when the Fed minutes come out and yeah, when the Fed definitely. statements come out. Um, so, you know, these the, the market moves in like half of a second. It's like, how could someone read the Fed statements, see what the difference is and then do the appropriate buy or sell? They're not doing that right there. You know, you could I don't want to say easily, but you could once you know what you're doing, write a uh, uh, Python or, or other type of code that says, OK, you know, just let's take the Fed example. We're looking for, you know, you know, people say, okay, the Fed statement might change from moderate to something else, right? Like mm-hmm. these little yeah. word yeah. changes that they do. Yeah. Exactly. So if you know what you're looking for, right, you could, you could just program the, um, you know, the algo to say, if, if, you know, scrape this thing in a half of a second, if it says that, you know, lift 10 year futures or whatever. Got right. It. So I, you know, and I think that happens a lot with the Trump too. You know, um, you know, you, you, there could be words that are that are programmed into the computer that if Trump says X, that should be bad for Y or whatever, right? So yeah, there's a lot of that going on, a lot of of scraping text um, by the computers um, to look for keywords. Um, so yeah, that's certainly a thing. Okay. All right. Um, how do algos treat um the overnight markets um or do most only trade regular hours that's a good question i so again that's kind of like the high frequency trading type 
Mm -hmm. algos, right? I mean, the, the market making or, or liquidity providing type algos. I, exactly. Again, I, I don't have a ton of experience with those things. I, the only, the only one that I did was, uh, again, we had a treasury one uh, when I was a market maker. Mm -hmm. So I would guess the citadels of the world run that thing all day, like 24 seven, yeah. like 24, five, if you will. Um, but I, I can't say I know from firsthand experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So next question, uh, what percent of trades are done with the algo versus having the human execute? So like in the world or by me? Uh, <laughs> I, I guess both. I guess both. I mean, you yourself, you, you actually execute it, right? I do. I do. Mm -hmm. So for, I, I'll just talk about me and then, um, yeah. F, so for myself, I, I did go through the exercise of, um, automating everything. Uh, so I did have it where, you know, I press a button and it all happens. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's not a lot of work and it makes me <laughs> a little nervous doing that just because, you know, yep. mistakes can happen. Mm -hmm. So exactly. it's not like I mind putting in the orders. I, in fact, I kind of like it because I see what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have that human bridge, if you will, whereas the computer spits out, put X, Y, and Z order in and I actually put it in. Um, and, you know, another thing that I have found by doing that is, you know, you do get ideas by doing that, you know, because you can see the strategy, what it's doing, and you can see, huh, well, maybe, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing to do. Maybe I should test this, you know, so I don't do any, I don't change anything on the fly by right. any means, but, you know, it could give you ideas as far as further testing. So I have found that benefit as well. So there's a dual benefit there, right? It's, it's eliminate, not eliminating, but um, that catastrophic event where, you know, your order gets put in a hundred times and, you know, you're broke. Um, that's, mm. uh, you know, avoided because I'm actually putting in the orders as well as it gives me new ideas and it's not very labor intensive. So I don't mind doing it at all. Um, as far as how many, you know, how much, so I, I'll say this, I mean, you know, it really is going to depend on the market, right? So, you know, I, I've heard estimates, so I don't know the, the right number, um, but, you know, in very liquid things, I would think it's a lot these days, right? So things like U.S. Treasury bonds, right, um, futures, especially like, you know, uh, S&P futures and such, um, individual stocks, especially the big names, you know, the, the computers have to dominate that market as far as the fast trading. Um, but, you know, as you guys probably know, or I know you do know, um, as you get more liquid, you know, there's still a human element. Um, yep. You know, I come from the bond world. So there is many parts of the bond world, whether it be CMOs or, you know, different types of structured products, you know, that are, I mean, never say never, but I don't think they're ever going to be electronic markets like that. They're just, you know, I, I used to trade bonds. I used to trade once every month. Okay. You know what I mean? So it's not like yeah. you can't have high frequency trading on that, right? They right. <laughs> trade by appointment over the phone, you know, exactly. so yeah. it really is going to depend on uh, the liquidity of the market there. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Next one. What latency does the algo have? So again, this is like high frequency trading stuff. So oh, okay. I, uh, you know, again, I just want to preface this with, I don't, you know, I don't mm -hmm. have that much experience there, but, um, you know, I know that's a big deal. So like the, the only knock that I've heard on Python is that if you need to trade in like a millisecond, then suppose, you know, then like things like C sharp is actually faster is what's called a compile oh. compiles faster. Um, so, I mean, this is not to say Python is quote unquote slow. I mean, to a regular human being, it happens in a second, right? But, yeah. you know, but as far as like C sharp might be a millisecond and, you know, Python <laughs> might be three times yeah. slower. So I'm just making yeah. those numbers up. But so for very, very high frequency stuff, you know, I do know that those other languages are used. And also you hear the stories of, you know, people buying, you know, or high frequency trading firms buying those like, you know, whatever those hyper like cables that like exactly right into the, <laughs> right into the exchange, exchange yeah. or whatever so yeah. certainly but but again you got to think about what you're doing right or, or is your trading strategy looking to take advantage of some market behavior or are you trying to like jump the line and, yeah. and provide liquidity right yeah, and exactly. those are two big different things yeah very much so mm -hmm. yeah 
Okay. All right. And I think uh, this will wrap it up for this. The last one, uh, what's the best way for a retail trader to learn and get into modeling? So, I mean, you know, I, I think there's a lot of great resources out there. I mean, you have to get your hands dirty, right? Um, there's a lot of good books. Um, you know, I've, I've used um, several courses such as Data Camp um, and others, Coursera, has, has a lot of coding courses. Um, so I guess I could plug myself here. So, you know, I, I do um, teach a Python coding course uh, called Python Programming for Traders. And so our thought with the course was, is that, you know, I'm basically self-taught programmer. And, um, you know, there's a lot of coding education out there. There's a lot of Python education out there. And this is not a knock on them, but they're not done by like real traders, right? It's going to be, you know, based by a professor or whatever. And again, that's not a knock on them. They don't try to be, they don't try to act like they're anything that they're not. So I don't want to see like I'm throwing shade at them, but you know, we thought that there was a, a room in the marketplace for Python programming specifically for traders, specifically for people that want to make models, make strategies. And, you know, we, meaning me and Larry and Connor's research, you know, he's been in business for 25 years. So um, we have a library of strategies that have, you know, good back tested results as well as live real results. Um, so, you know, we use real strategies that you could use as examples. And that's another thing about coding. If I can give anyone any advice, try to find something that's interesting to you to code. I mean, I can't say it enough. Mm -hmm. Like I, I see a lot of, of, you know, the coding education and stuff, you know, you get to start somewhere, but I see a lot of it be like, you know, write some rinky dinky, uh, you know, little program that like, you know, does tic-tac-toe or something. And that's just tough because like, you're not going to be really interested in that. Right. And coding is frustrating. I don't care who you are, especially when you start, it's going to be frustrating. So if you're writing a program, that's just like for academic purposes, for just an example that you're never going to use, that you're not going to, that doesn't align with your interests. It's going to be really hard to keep that interest. Yes. Right. Whereas mm -hmm. if you think of, um, after you get the very basics down, you, you know, you have a goal in mind. Okay. I want to, you know, make a trend following strategy. Right. And I want to have it all. I want to model it myself. I want to code it myself. You know, I want to do all that kind of stuff. And it, it's an interest of you, of yours that is really going to, you know, um, accelerate your, your learning. And that's what, it, yeah, that's right. what happened to me. Right. I mean, as soon as you start working on something that you're interested in, it really keeps you there. So that would be my advice to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So yeah, I, okay. there's a lot of, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there's, there's a lot of education. I think ours is really good because it's specifically designed for traders in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, not perfect. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was gonna um, say. Like when it, it's not work if it's fun. If it's yeah. you know your interest to to the point you were saying. Absolutely, so, and if I could just say one more thing yeah, to that, yeah. I mean, you know, you you said it's fun. Okay, it it, it gets fun. Okay, it's not gonna be fun at the beginning, <laughs> and I tell people this. I'm I'm honest because coding is it, it's hard to pick up. You know, and there's a learning curve. It's just like anything. It's like, you know let's take a sport. It's like, once you're good at a sport, it's fun. Right. But like yeah, right. when you start and you stink, it's not fun. Right. So mm -hmm. there is a hurdle to get over. Right. If you get over that hurdle, then it's great, man. I think, I think having that, that, the coding knowledge, I, I feel like I have a superpower sometimes because I could just check, I got to like fact check anyone. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, don't, don't just give me these rules of thumb. Like let's just, <laughs> let's just stick to it. But yeah, it yeah. takes time to get there, you know, it sure. takes time to get there. So, but it, it is fun once you get to a point for sure. Yeah. I was just going to ask, um, just to hop in here. I've, I've been reading your book and um, I, I found uh, a, a portion of it quite fascinating. It was the, uh, the summary of investor behavior uh, underlying price trends, this, the story of Bob mm -hmm. and, and I've, and just kind of going back over the period of this market, say from summer till now, um, you know, I, I see that very much sort of taking place, um, you know, uh, where people are sort of under reacting to a trend and kind of not believing it. And then sort of hopping in late cycle is, is uh, I think that, I think it's very fascinating because I, I, you know, we teach people and, you know, a lot of people are just, 
you know, so hell bent on shorting this market um, and they're, or they're not, you know, they're not willing to buy it because, you know, we, we look at auction market theory and it, it, it's sort of, you know, we look at the structure of the market too, but uh, do you, could you comment on that? Like in, you know, what you're seeing nowadays in the last sort of five, six months? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, you, you nailed it on the head. I mean, so, you know, in the book, I speak about um, some of the behavioral biases where I think, so let me take a step back. The, the, the two broad market tendencies, right. That we talk about and we, we, uh, you know, write systems around is basically the tendency for, for securities to overreact and then mean revert in a shorter term mm-hmm. time frame, right? So we're talking about days yep. and then trend over a call it intermediate to longer term time frame, right? And mm-hmm. it's it not like I made that up, right? I mean, there's a lot of academic evidence that shows that. So the thought is, you know, what behavioral biases, um, you know, contribute to those tendencies. Um, and, you know, like you, you referenced the book of the story of Bob, you know, the, the summary, and I won't go into every behavioral bias because this gets a little boring, but the, um, you know, the, the summary of that is that, you know, everyone has a narrative in their head. Let's say mm-hmm. the stock market's for suckers, okay? Mm-hmm. So, so no one is buying. And then the stock market starts going up and people are, are very slow to change their perception. And then it goes up again and you see your neighbor start getting rich or whatever, mm-hmm. right? your, your brother-in-law, right? So then you start jumping in and then it's like, wow, this is easy. And then you go all in and then that, you know what I mean? So, so it's just like a, a, a slow, you know, a initial underreaction and prolonged overreaction. That's how I describe it. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I do see that now. I mean, you know, you saw, I mean, Think about last year, right? This time last year, I mean, people people are so quick to forget. I mean, we had an I don't want to call it a crash, but I mean, it was it, it was, was pretty a, pretty serious, you know. It was Christmas, a good rug pull, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Christmas, <laughs> Christmas Eve was something else. I was oh, like, it was, I yeah. I was like, this wasn't yeah. supposed to happen on Christmas Eve. I mean, exactly, I'm, I'm exactly. Like, I'm like, I'm not like my grandma's house, like on my phone. I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> yeah, no uh, kidding. You know, it's yeah. uh, you know we uh, you know uh, we trade something called market profile, and it yep. and it's you know price over over time, so price acceptance versus rejection. And do you use any of that in your behavioral sort of um, you, you know analysis? You know, I, I don't, but I know a lot of people do. I know you guys are champions of it. I would love to to check it out more. I'm certainly curious, but as of right now, I, I don't. But I do know what it is, um, and it certainly seems like a very valuable tool. Okay, cool. Yeah, just, just curious because I've always been fascinated with, uh, you know, the behavioral side of this. And, 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 you know, in simpler terms for me because, you know, I, you know, I, I don't come from the white shoe firm type, you know, sort of thing. So I uh, – I just noticed, and I kept telling people, you know, they're, they're, you could just feel the fear in the summer. It was all over the place. Mm-hmm. And then you could, you could very, very, you, you could really feel that fear shift to greed um, over the last couple of months. Yeah, um, totally. You know, just in the press and just the way people were talking. And it was, it was really noticeable this time. And it's so funny. It's like price drives the narrative, right? I mean, it's oh, yeah. like mm-hmm. things are going up and they go hear positive economic stories and things exactly. are going down, yeah. and, you know, and um, so yeah, price drives the narrative and, and, you know, those, bi- those biases are real, you know, it's people are fearful. They don't jump in. And then once you see the price go up, it's like, okay, now all of the, the coast is clear. Right. So it's and a lot of, a lot of people should be doing the opposite of that. So yeah, I have, so just to comment, I mean, I, I do think that people are turning a little greedy, but I, I got to tell you, I, I don't think we're at any kind of euphoric level. No, I mean, no. Yeah. To, to your yeah. point. I mean, I still see on Twitter constantly, everyone, from the oh it's the fed and this and that and they don't want to buy this thing and you know it's like um you know there there's such pessimism at all-time highs and you see yeah. a lot of the sentiment uh surveys as well whether it be it, it, this is retail investors as well as institutional investors mm-hmm. um people being very pessimistic you see uh equity etf and mutual fund outflows in a year that s&p is up what 27 percent um so yeah i certainly if you want to make a bull case and you know i don't trade off of this it's just my yeah. opinion but you want to make a bull case i mean that's it i think a lot of people are still very pessimistic and i think there's a lot of people that could jump in here uh out of greed well interesting i just had one more question sure. uh, you know when you started you said your first firm was sort of an old school firm and it was the partnership model um, 
do you think, you know, as we've evolved away from that, you know, these firms going public and, you know, getting infused with OPM, other people's money, do you think mm -hmm. um, that the risk, um, you know, that we're taking now in the old days, the partners that, you know, they, you know, you had all these old guys sitting around looking at the books every night. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they were like with a Hawkeye, you know, uh, and now things are a little bit more loosey goosey, it seems. Oh, totally. I mean, that's just the incentives. I mean, that's just totally, I mean, you know, y you have, so yeah, like you said, when I started, I mean, it was um, an old school Wall Street partnership. Most of the traders were partners uh, when I came in, right? So it's like, you know, you're learning from partners. They had the real money on the line. Like they're mm. not going to let you be a cowboy. You exactly. know, you, you know yeah. they're, you're, they're going to watch you like a hawk. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, that was a different culture. And now, you know, with this, with sell side, I mean, you got to think of the incentives. Yeah. You know, like th think of the asymmetric incentives from sell side traders. Like you, you know, you swing for the fences, you do well, you get a huge bonus. If you don't, you get fired. But like, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's yeah. okay. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, I do think that changes the risk profile and, and you know, the, those, those partnerships, I'm glad I got to experience it. I don't think they're ever going to come back. It was really, it was a cool atmosphere. Yeah, it's, I guess it's like uh, big bands are not coming back. Yeah. <laughs> Neither are partnerships. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. All right, cool. All right. So a couple more questions for you, Chris, uh, kind of like miscellaneous questions. We're done with all the sure. coding and, and uh, modeling. Um, what, what's a commonly held belief in trading uh, or finance uh, that you disagree with? Hmm. Commonly held belief that I disagree with. Mm-hmm. I want to get this right. So, you know, I'm a, a CMT. Um, I don't know if you're a chartered market technician and I'm yep. pretty, uh, you know, involved with that. And uh, so I don't want to upset my fellow CMTs, but you know, <laughs> w one thing that I, I haven't just found true is this thought that like, um, you know, people say markets are fractal, meaning like the same patterns happen, you know, on the monthly candles, it's like the five minute candles. Mm -hmm. I haven't found that to be true. Maybe I'm missing something, but you know, it's not like I could just take the same rules that work on like daily candles and, and, you know, use them for 10 minute candles. So, you know, a lot of people say, say that, um, and you know, I, I haven't found that to be, to be true. I'm sure once I hang up, I'm going to think of many others that, that I failed to mention, but that that's one that comes right to mind. Okay. All right, cool. All right. So traders, you know, obviously there's traders who trade different markets, have different trading styles, et cetera. But what do you think is like one universal like skill or trait that all successful traders possess? I think one of the best things, uh, and, and, you know, you're a poker player, so you, so you're going to get this immediately. I, 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 and I'm not like you, but I, I had a big time poker phase when I was in college too. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think one of the huge skills that you could have is to not judge every trade by if you made money or not. Right. You just want right. to say, did you do the right thing at the time? Did you, um, you know, play the probabilities correctly? I mean, to make a poker analogy, right. If you're playing hold them and you have pocket aces and you get all your money in the middle and some guy calls you a pocket tens and he gets a 10, like yeah. that's not a bad play just because you lost money. On to the next hand. Yeah. Oh yeah. What yes. are you going to do? Yeah. So, so that, you know, letting go of that is, is a big deal. Um, so, yeah. so I think that's no matter what, um, whether you're discretionary, systematic, short term, long term, thinking about all of these, you know, if for lack of a better term bets or trades in probabilistic terms and not right. in, you know, uh, resulting, if you will, is, I think that's a skill that everyone needs to learn. And just as one more thing about that, you know, I, I've seen personally, um, you know, people struggle with that, that are very, very smart because it's like in academia mm, in, in your right. whole life, it's like, you know, two plus two is four. Like there's, there's, there's right answers to the test. Right. And if you got it right, you did, you know, then, you know, you got a good grade. And if you didn't, you didn't get a good grade. It's very kind of black and white in, in the market in an uncertain environment. It's not like that. Like mm -hmm. it's not just cause you make money, you did the right thing, you know? So I've, I've found that people that are way smarter than me struggle with that. 
And I think that's one thing that you need no matter what type of trader you are. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that answer. I couldn't agree anymore. I mean, especially with the first part, you know, it's what poke, poker's taught me so many, like just the skills to be good at poker has helped me learn life, the, uh, life since, uh, or skills in life, you know, um, separating uh, the result from the process, you know, being yep. results oriented. And then just on the last part, you nailed too. I mean, it's like, I, I don't, I don't look at things in black and white, like ever. Yep. I'm like, uh, maybe 80% chance that this will happen. You know, it's funny. I even asked Jay today. I was like, Hey, what well, what are the percent chances you think will hit? I forget what level it was, but uh, I can't help it. That's all I look at things now is, is uh, in percentages. Yeah, and it's really interesting. I mean, you're trained to think like that now. I think I am because I've been in the markets for so many years now. But, you know, like I said, it's not actually natural to think like that because no, we, yeah. we, we mm -hmm. weren't really raised like that. Like no. school, schooling does not teach you that, right? Schooling <laughs> teaches you the opposite. <laughs> exactly. It teaches you that there's a right way and a wrong way, you know, and it's not like a probabilistic thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, people definitely struggle with that. Yeah. Yeah. Since, since you said you played uh, poker in college, but you play online live, uh, tell me a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so I, so I was in college from 2004 to 2008. Oh, you're so in I think good years. Good yeah. Years, I think my, I think moneymaker won in what, 2003 or something. So yeah. Was it, like it was the, either three or four. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that was like the huge boom. Right. So, yeah. uh, I went to Penn state. Um, so there was a bunch of games. I mean, it's a huge school. Right. So, yeah. you know, I started, um, you know, I was always kind of obsessed with money. So, um, you know, I started playing there and then, um, you know, I started playing online and then, you know, we were a relatively quick three hour drive from AC Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, in the Taj, uh, which is not, no longer there, uh, you know, they used to not like car juice. We used to play when we were like 18 years old. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I had a, had a, I haven't played in a while, but uh, I definitely had a big time face. I, I love the game. Yeah. Yeah. You do you still play a little bit at all or? I, I can't say I do, unfortunately. I, yeah. I would love to, but I, uh, no, I haven't really been playing. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny. We, we had a guest on uh, uh, Scott, um, what was his last Scott San Emeterio? Maybe I hopefully I'm not butchering his name, but he reminds me a lot of you. He was a um, what was he in J B uh, Bond or Credit Swiss? He was at Credit Swiss, yeah. He was actually the player, yeah. He was the guy who was actually uh, you know, uh, building uh, the CDOs and uh, one of the guys who actually read the offering memorandum, so, oh. so yeah. And uh, now he's a CEO. He had to write them. Yeah, because he had to write them, so yeah, yeah. So now he's the CEO of a, a company trying to combine trading and uh, sports. But uh, yeah, you remind me a lot of him. Just very sharp. Um, I think it's the poker background. That's that's what I always tell people. There you go. Like <laughs> but yeah, so uh, so Chris, when you aren't coding and building models, what are you doing? What are you doing your leisure time? Oh, good question. Uh, do a lot of you know fitness, if you will. Me and my wife are pretty into CrossFit. Um, I also. I grew up wrestling, um, like amateur wrestling, you know, not like WWF. <laughs> so, so, Greco Roman, yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. Freestyle. So uh, I still do that. Uh, you know, so I'm a big I'm a big reader as well. So I would say that those two things are really, really my interest. Awesome, oh, awesome. Um so yes. Vision Quest is one of your favorite movies. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a classic. Vision Quest, yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. All right. Let's see here. Um, all right. So you're Mark, you're a, you were a market maker and the show was called confessions of a market maker. Now I, I know you were, I know you're more of like a white shoe guy and all, but we, you know, we're going to need a confession. You're on the show. Oh, Any crazy story, wow. wild moment, et cetera, that you can share. I'm trying to think. Yeah. I mean, I remember um, the flash crash. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I got creamed in the flash crash and it was just really, really bad luck. So, um, you know, so what happened in the flash crash, obviously is stocks tanked as you guys um, know, and you know, trading it. Yeah. Bond, you know, bonds ripped obviously. Right. Yep. So, um, you know, a big customer came in, um, you know, wanting, wanted to do a transaction, you know, I gave them a good price because, you know, I was getting pressure from the salesperson and again it's a good customer and all this kind of stuff so i was short a bunch of um 30 year bonds which is the you know, the most duration basically on the whole curve um and you know so but 
duration, if you're not familiar, means just like they can move more when interest rates move, right? So all of a sudden it's like, you know, I'm in it, so I'm, I'm getting out of it and I'm like kind of working to order. And, you know, in, in normal times, right, like, um, you know, you're short, so you have to buy it back. So, you know, you mm-hmm. give some orders to some brokers and they, <laughs> they hopefully like give you, to give you a better price. And, and, and almost all the time, you know, you are rewarded for that patience, you know, yeah. instead of just, you know, um, you know, lifting the first offer that you see, yeah, you, know, exactly. you know, you try to work it all this kind of stuff. So I was, I was doing that. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, you know, and it's like stocks just fell out of bed and bonds are like ripping. I'm like, what the heck's going on? And I, hadn't, you know, I, it wasn't as bad as it could have been because I, I, I did, I did cover like on the way up as opposed to, you know, cause it just, it just ripped. Um, yeah. but yeah, that, I had the, go into my boss and tell him, you know, we lost a couple hundred grand here. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but, you know, just tell him the story of uh, what happened. And, you know, if you could, if you could spin it as, you know, I was trying to do right by the customer, then, you know, you usually got away with it, if you will. So yeah, yeah that, that's one story that comes directly to mind. <laughs> All right. We'll just take a quick break to plug our sponsor, Traders Creed. Are you guys still looking for a last minute gift? Well, Confessions of a Market Maker is pleased to announce uh, official p- sponsor of the pod, Traders Creed, celebrating traders and investors' success, providing apparel and merchandise with humor and wit along the way. Choose from a variety of apparel, designs, and products for the trader in your life. Visit traderscreed.com. Chris, so uh, tell us a little bit about your book. Yeah, so the so the book, uh, my general thought with the book, right, is that you know I read a lot of trading books, um, and you know some of varying sophistication levels, etc. But you know I read a lot of trading books, and I've read a lot of behavioral finance books, um, but I never saw them really kind of put together. So that's kind of that was my main thought of the book um, when we first started writing it. So you know I wanted to give an explanation as to some of the market tendencies, why I think they happen, what kind of behavioral bias from investors are behind these tendencies that we see over and over and over again in the market and then you know basically present trading strategies to take advantage of that so we present four trading strategies Um, so I would say the three main um, you know big ideas if you will in the book are number one what I said have trading strategies that are rooted in you know investor behavioral biases and you know the reason is because you know, I view that those biases are not going to go away and that creates sustainable alpha, if you will, or a sustainable Mm -hmm. edge, something that isn't going to go away. Right. So um, that's one big idea. Another big idea is what we call um, attacking portfolio management by uh, first principles. So first principles are the thought of, um, you know, objective truths, things that wouldn't cause controversy, things that everyone can agree on, right? Like mm-hmm. the, the sky's blue type thing, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, you know, the, the three uh, first principles that we came up with for the market is that markets go up, down, and through times of stress. So up meaning like we have bull market phases, like we're in one right now, um, down meaning we have bear market phases, and times of stress meaning like we have acute or you know, shorter term panics, if you will. So if you get to have strategies that are designed to prosper in each of those situations, you know you will naturally um, build a portfolio of uncorrelated strategies. And that leads to the third big idea of the book, which is that putting uncorrelated strategies together into a portfolio is really the best thing you could do to um, improve the quality of the portfolio. And by quality, I mean, um, you know, improve your risk adjusted returns. So, you know, what's going to happen is you're going to get basically the weighted average of the returns of all the strategies, but your risk. So your standard deviation, you know, your max drawdown, et cetera, is going to go down markedly provided that they're uh, uncorrelated. And, you know, that was really a eureka moment for me. Um, You know, we reference, uh, you know, billionaire Ray Dalio. I don't know if you read his book, Principles, but, you know, he has that amazing chart in there, which just shows how the risk or standard deviation of a portfolio goes down if you add different alphas, if you will, trading strategies, uh, asset classes, whatever, to a portfolio and how the line goes down quicker if they're less correlated. So mm-hmm. those are the three main uh, main ideas of the book. Nice, nice, good stuff. And 
you mentioned you're a big reader. So when you're not reading trading or investing finance books, do you, uh, what's a favorite subject of yours? <laughs> uh, so I, I'll be honest, I'm pretty boring. Most of, but most of the books are finance books and trading <laughs> books. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I do like to read some sports books though. Um, uh-huh. so I would say like uh, biographies of, of sports, uh, you know, players would be the, the other, okay. uh, the other interest. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, so, so sports fan, what's, uh, who do you follow? So I'm from Pittsburgh, man. So I follow Steelers. Um, okay. Big Steelers guy. Like I said, I went to Penn State. So, um, you know, I follow Penn State football. Um, I'm a big, you know, wrestling fan. So Penn State wrestling is the best in the country. Um, won eight out of the last nine NCAA championships. So I follow them very closely. Um, so those would be the three things that I really, really follow closely, I would say. Cool. Excellent. And once we get off the pod, we'll have to uh, do a little side bet. I'm a Jets fan. Uh, we got you guys this week, the Steelers. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So maybe, maybe uh, once we get off, we'll, we'll talk a little numbers. Okay. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> so with that, Jay, any uh, any more questions for uh, for Chris? No, no, no. That's uh, that's pretty much it for me. It was uh, really great, uh, you know, talking to you. And I'm I really I have to tell our people who are who are listening to uh, to get his book and read mm-hmm. it, um, the Alpha Formula, because there's a lot of stuff, especially the guys you know that that we talk to in our room, um, and they don't really understand what's going on in the mechanics of, of what's going on. But he also brings up a, a really, really good behavioral um, sort of background and, and it sort of really cements um, almost why markets move and why people react to them in certain ways. And I think that's very, very important when you're trading, even if you're trading in a day time frame. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who trade in the day time frame who get short thinking the market's going to go to zero. Um, and I don't know why that happens, um, but it just shows, you know, kind of like a fundamental misunderstanding of what's actually going on. Mm. So the more knowledge you get, um, you know, from gentlemen, like, uh, you know, like, and this book is, uh, is absolutely amazing. Cause I just read that and I was like, Oh my God, that's exactly what's gone on in the last six months. Yeah. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I was trying to explain this to people and they're like, no. And I'm like, well, no, this is what's going on. And, um, this is a, a much more eloquent way of putting it than I came up with. So Yeah. And, and that's another thing about like, just real fast. I mean, about being a market maker, man, it's like you learn that prices move for one reason because people are lifting offers, hitting bids. That's it. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter what the heck the reason is, if it's logical or not, that's what's moving it. So, you know, you could be quote unquote right and get on your high horse about some fundamental mm-hmm. opinion, but you know what, if people are buying, it's going to go up. So that's it. Mm-hmm. All right. And with that, that concludes today's episode of confessions of a market maker. If you guys enjoyed the podcast, please rate and review it for us. If you're interested in learning market profile, if you're keen on trading a liquid market, if you got a small account, if you trade crude oil, Come join JJ and I at microefutures.com. Chris, tell the listeners where to find you and anything else. You'd like sure, to absolutely. So our website is tradingmarkets.com. You could find the book there. You could find the Python course there. Uh, the book will be on Amazon uh, next month, but if you want to buy it right now, it's on Trading Markets. Um, also on Twitter, my handle is at Python Trader. Um, yep, so friend me. Hmm. Follow me. There you go. Follow him, friend him, Chris. Really appreciate you, man. I really like your holistic approach and your uh, your uh, almost like I want to call it like balanced approach to trading. You know, still keeping a little bit of that human element, but also, you know, the modeling and all that's uh, real appealing to me. Um, and just the the strategy and the approach I take to poker. So really appreciate you sharing all your knowledge with us. I think Jay, this probably have to be the most like informative podcast well, we've I'm- had. I'd say. It's it's really good because, you know, this whole algo thing, everyone, it's been clouded in a sort of a veil of, of mystery and, and, and people are so, it's almost like in the 90s, everybody thought market makers were evil when we, all we were doing is providing liquidity. Um, you know, um, so it's really good to sort of <laughs> unmask things and, and, you know, educate people as to actually what's really going on. Thank you, guys. Thank you, JJ and Ray. Thanks for having me on. This is really awesome. Absolutely. It was Appreciate great you, having man. you. Yep. And, yep. So for 
Chris Kane, I'm Harold, he's Kumar. You stop, though. Have a good night.